So I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Steele. Dr. Jeffrey Steele has generously offered to share his time with us. Once again, he's been here a couple of times over. He's passionate about what he does and those he serves. He is a trained professional who is a great listener and delivers advice with empathy. Today, Dr. Steele is here to help us look a little deeper into our own self-awareness on this journey of caring for our loved ones living with dementia. A bit about Dr. Steele. He has two BA degrees and two master degrees from St. Andrews in Scotland. Dr. Jeffrey Steele is a bereavement service manager for Volusia, Flagner, and Putnam counties for VTAS Healthcare. His role is to provide psychological, social, and spiritual education to the VTAS team, as well as bereavement support training to the company. He works with the marketing department to provide education to facilities about services they offer. To date, they serve over 900 people. In addition to all that, Dr. Steele facilitates numerous caregiver support groups. He is part of a national team for VTAS Healthcare. Dr. Steele also co-leads a support group for parents who have lost children. On a personal note, he has lived abroad in London, England for 16 years and has returned to Florida in 2020. He loves surfing, and right before the meeting, he told us he carved out time for us, but is leaving on a surfing trip tomorrow to Costa Rica. So Dr. Steele, the meeting is now yours and thank you for being here again with us. So uh, I, I titled my, my talk today, um, which is something that um, I'm also on the journey with all of you with caring for and being a caregiver a bit with a loved one who is uh, suffering with probably stage, near stage five um, dementia. And um, it is, so not only a professional uh, journey that I do every day, it's also a personal one as well. And one of the things that I have learned um, through my professional experience and also through my personal experience is that Coping with our emotions on an ever-changing journey with dementia can sometimes be and feel um, very difficult. In other words, we can like be into a groove of something and then something changes with the loved one and we have to then shift and pivot our feelings, our emotions, all over again because we thought we were on a routine and then all of a sudden the routine can feel like we're starting at ground zero again. As a result of that, what can happen and what often does happen that I should say as well that's often ignored or it's, it's suppressed or pushed to the side because we are caregiving um, is because we can then experience a lot of guilt, frustration, sadness, and all those other emotions that occur with grief. And we can talk about that a lot during the question and answer time, but I'll touch on it some today in the, in the uh, actual talk here. One of the things that often happens during the dementia and the Alzheimer's disease process is that behavior changes in our loved ones. And it's that change of behavior that often does create that sense of um, having to start over a lot. It challenges um, our caregiving for our loved one um, with dementia. Um, there are personality changes often. There are behavioral changes. And um, we can best meet those challenges when we kind of dig into the little bit of uh, creativity that's within all of us and to seek some flexibility, uh, patience, and compassion. One of the things that I do in my education for facilities and also for our program here 
and for our staff and the facilities that we contract with is a virtual dementia tour. Some of you may have done that or have experienced that before where we allow people to feel and experience some of the neurological stimuli that some of our loved ones may experience um, with that dementia, um, Alzheimer's process of the disease, which can lead then to, I think, often what it does is lead to further compassion and understanding about what's going on, particularly when we have that difficulty of we get into this rhythm and all of a sudden there's a nosedive and we are starting all over, as I said at the beginning. One of the things that we all want to do because we're human is that we want to help and fix and change sometimes the person who is inflicted with this disease. And it's very important for us to remember that this loved one has a brain disorder. Um, and that brain disorder shapes who the person has become and will become. So it is not their fault. So when we, as human beings, we all do this. And maybe you don't, but I often do that. Um, it's very easy to try to change somebody's behavior. Um, but we will almost always be very unsuccessful or be met with great resistance um, when we seek to do that. And what happens is that when we begin to feel that sense of having to start over and we're, we can't fix, we can't change, we can't reason, we can't discuss, we can't come to an easy conclusion through rational arguments and um, convincing someone of something, the feelings of defeat can become inevitable. So what do we do in these ever-changing circumstances of this process of this disease? One of the things that I find very practical that I help with my, with my groups that I do, I do, I do 15 of these per month, is I try to help the people and help us all, and for myself and my family as well, to accommodate the behavior, not to try and control or fix the behavior. For example, if the person insists on sleeping on the floor, what do we do? Do we fight and argue and say, it's not good, you don't need to be sleeping on the floor, um, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes that may actually be a safer place for them to sleep because of fall issues and with, when there's particularly issues of uh, they're not being able to um, uh, stop themselves or control their uh, fall, is to accommodate them, place a mattress on the floor in order to make them more comfortable. Here's an accommodation of a behavior because we learned, I hope we all learned very quickly that it's very difficult to control behavior with this disease. Um, can you all still see me? No. Okay, something's just, uh, someone's, sorry, did it turn a, a call no, thing off? There I am. So we have to remember that we can change our behavior or the physical environment in which we live along with our loved one. And changing our own behavior has an extremely positive impact that will result in the change of behavior um, of our loved one. So we have to remember behavior is often the result of some stimulating factor that's taking place because often our loved ones cannot clearly and fully communicate their needs. I deal with this every day, as I mentioned before, with a, a Down syndrome daughter who has IDD, which is an intellectual developmental delay, who's 10 and cannot communicate her needs. And oftentimes her behavior 
is very, very similar to somebody who is um, struggling with and being diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's because the part of the brain that affects the ability to reason and to understand something simple like time um, is not working fully and properly any long, longer or in our daughter's case has yet to do so. But changing our behavior and realizing, okay, this person's trying to communicate something to me. They are frustrated. And rather than get frustrated myself, which encourages more frustration, what are we going to do? Um, so our re realizing that, that our stimulating words and actions have a powerful impact um, on the caregiver, us, ourselves, and also the patient. Because one of the reasons why we teach the way we do in our program and in my philosophy of teaching on dementia and Alzheimer's to the caregiver is because that the more we're educated in understanding the disease process, that is a help for us and a tool to keep our stress levels down. And if our stress levels then are down in our caregiving, then what the um, stimulation of anxiety that we may sometimes, in our weakness, we're human, it happens, communicate to our loved one will often increase theirs. So it's important, of course, to let your doctors know about that, uh, to speak with your medical team, um, because behavioral problems may have an underlying medical um, reason as well. Perhaps the person is in pain, experiencing an adverse side effect. Uh, to medications. So, for instance, like in the vir virtual dementia tour, what we will do is we will simulate sometimes, we'll put these little uh, spike things in the bottom of the people's shoes who are going through it to simulate neuropathy. We will put gloves and things on their hands where it will also sim uh, simulate neuropathy in their hands and the ability to get pills or to do simple tasks. Um, then we have earphones on them with all sorts of background noises going on constantly. Um, and then we put um, glasses on uh, to simulate that a tunnel vision. And then all they can do then is see, and it's quite blurry as well and dark um, because uh, the last color I believe to go is, is the color of red. Um, so they, then are they given tasks to do in a room for five minutes, and they will have to perform those tasks with all of this going on at the same time. And what this does is this is, helps us to realize that there may be things that are going on with this loved one that we think that their behavior is changing, but there's been a great dip, there's been a great decline, things are getting worse. I thought we had this under control, but now this new behavior is happening happening. Like, for instance, one of my clients that we see, um, the um, caregiver, um, and the uh, mother is in me memory care, and I see the mother there when I go to the facility, is that she was constantly taking her shoes off and throwing them. And everyone's wondering, what's going on? Why is she doing this? Why is she changing this behavior? But I encourage them to say, you know, one, what's her medical background? Does she have a history of diabetes? Does she have a history of neuropathy? Because this can, this can increase that neuropathy. This can increase that pain. And there's a possibility that her reaction to having shoes on her feet and her taking them off and throwing them, and then she becomes calm, those shoes may be hurting her feet. And so um, what it is is that this sort of thing helps us to really not only think about the disease process in our communication and what we're able to reason and convince and what we're not, but also to really begin to take a step back sometimes and watch behaviors. Because when we see the behavior changes, we know that there's often a, a change in the disease process. Because why do I bring out behavior when we want to talk about how this impacts our own anticipatory grief? Because behavior always has a purpose, all right? So people with dementia typically cannot tell us what they need. Sometimes they can, sometimes. Sometimes they can say one thing and do one thing and remember certain things, 
but not other things. So, for example, again, I have a client who this gentleman is 86 years old, and he remembers how important it is. His wife is 82. He will pull his chair out for his wife at the dinner table. He remembers to do that, to be a gentleman. He will not eat his food or take a bite of his food until she has sat down with him at the table. And this is amazing that he remembers to do that. However, she reminds him that he needs to go into the bathroom and to use the bathroom. And then he forgets that he needs to pull his trousers down and go to the bathroom. So behavior has a purpose. And people with dementia, typically, if they cannot tell us what their needs are, they might do something, like take all the clothes out of the closet, or um, we wonder what, and we wonder why in the world are they doing this? What's going on? Why are they doing this? It is very likely that the person is actually fulfilling a need that they have and to be busy, to be productive, to be doing something. So it's important to always consider what the need the person might be trying to meet with their behavior. And when it's possible, when it's safe, try to accommodate them in this behavior. Because behavior is triggered always. It's important to understand that all behavior is triggered and it occurs for a reason. It might be something a person did that triggers a certain behavior, or it could be a change in the physical environment of the person. And the route to changing behavior is disrupting the patterns that we create. And when we disrupt the patterns that we've created, we then begin to also be affected in our behavior. And so we may need to say, okay, it's time to step back and take a different approach and to try different consequences. Because what works today, and this is something with the grief process that I'm about to go through with you, what works today may not work tomorrow. And coming to that place of acceptance that that's the reality of this disease will help us to be able to better respond. Doesn't mean we always do it well, we're human, but we will be able to better respond to the multiple factors that influence any sorts of behaviors that are concerning to us and the natural progression of this disease process. And it means that solutions that were effective yesterday may not be effective tomorrow. And the key to managing those things is to do our very best to be creative, flexible in our strategies, and to address any given issue. But let's be honest, because one of the things I do with my clients and with my patients is to be honest. Because what this can do, it creates anticipatory grief. In any person, any human being that has ever experienced loss, of any kind of a significant loss experiences grief. Now, one thing about grief that is often misunderstood, because as human beings, we don't like some of the emotions of anger, guilt, sadness, some depression, um, being uh, feeling out of control. Um, those feelings that go along, regret, bargaining, all these sort, 
sorts of things that go um, into that grief process that we all experience as human beings is often um, we have that human capacity to ignore that. And the reason that we do that is because some of those emotions aren't pleasant to experience. But the thing that's important about grief is that grief is not our enemy. Grief is actually our friend for healing. What do I mean? I'll give an example. So for all you Floridians here will know I-75 um, that goes straight up to Florida and gets into, say, um, Atlanta, Georgia. Once you get to Atlanta, Georgia, you can take 275 to go all the way around Atlanta. And we often do that and come to find out many times, which I have, which I have done that, is that um, it took me longer to get around Atlanta than it probably would have been to go just straight through it, through the city up I-75. When we avoid grief, we often do that. And that 275 goes all the way around Atlanta. And we get on that merry-go-round of avoidance of dealing with the emotions that we have and experiencing loss, that it's not easy, not easy. I want to want you to hear me there. This is not an easy path to take, but it's actually that vehicle of grief going driving us straight through the city of Atlanta, to use that metaphor, that actually brings us to the other side of the city where we can experience acceptance and hope. Because that's the goal of grief. Now, there are a number of myths about grief. There's myths about grief, and there are facts about grief. Here's the first myth, and this is what many of us do. The pain will go away if I ignore it. If I just ignore this, and not try to feel it, the pain will go away. And what that does is that sweeps all of that grief and those emotions that accompany grief underneath the rug, and the rug begins to raise, and over a period of time when it gets high, it becomes a fall problem for us, and we trip over it and can fall. So pain doesn't go away faster if we ignore it. That's the myth. The fact of grief and grieving is to realize that trying to ignore our pain or keep it from surfacing will only make it worse in the long run. Because our goal in loss, and we do experience loss with dementia and Alzheimer's, but our goal for this is real healing. And in order for real healing to take place, it is necessary for us as human beings, with the help of others if we need it, to face our grief and to actively deal with it. The second myth is this. It's important to be strong in the face of grief, almost like being stoic. That's a myth. Feeling sad feeling frightened, feeling lonely. These are all normal reactions, normal, normal human reactions to the feelings of loss. They are normal. Crying doesn't mean we are weak people. You don't need to, quote, unquote, protect your family and friends by putting on a brave face. Showing our true feelings, actually, can help them and us. And this is why I say grief can be our friend if we journey in it properly. Another myth is if you don't cry, you weren't sad about the loss. Not true. The fact is, is that crying is indeed a normal response to sadness that the body creates, but it's not the only one. Those who don't cry may feel the pain just as deeply as others do, and they may simply have other ways of showing it. 
The thing about grief is the exact same thing about dementia and Alzheimer's. Every dementia and Alzheimer's patient has their own fingerprint with the disease, their own. There are no two people who are exactly the same with their disease process. Grief is the exact same way. There is no right way. There is no wrong way to grieve, to grieve, except to ignore grief. But grief has its own fingerprint for each and every individual. And that is to be heard, understood, acknowledged, and validated. That's so important. Okay? So here is another myth. Grief should last simply about a year. False. That's a myth. There is no specific time frame whatsoever for grief. How long it takes is different from person to person. Okay? So you don't have to think, oh, my goodness, What's wrong with me? I just can't, you know, I'm not dealing with this well right now. This this is very, very difficult for me, and I'm feeling very frustrated a lot. I get angry. I'm very impatient. Um, I say terrible things sometimes in my anger. All of that is the fact that you're a human being. You're human. And we feel enduring significant loss out of control sometimes. So the final myth is moving on with your life means that you forget about your loss. That's not true. Moving on actually means that we are accepting the loss. I can't change this. I can't control this. And I'm accepting that this is where we are today. I can't change yesterday. I can't predict the future. But I can live in the present moment. And one of the things that my Down syndrome daughter teaches me, besides love and patience, is that she wonderfully lives in the present moment. She doesn't care what happened yesterday. She doesn't care what's happening later on. She only cares about what's going on in that very present moment. And I think that she teaches me that living that way, particularly sometimes in caregiving and the difficulty of Alzheimer's and a dementia patient caregiving, living in the present moment, if we embrace that, it takes away so much pressure off us of us to try and fix anything or to try to change anything or to try to maneuver or manipulate anything. And we realize, I'm going to go into this situation. I don't know what I'm going to find when I cross the threshold of this bedroom. But whatever I find, I'm going to deal with that in the present moment. And that's where we are today. Because I realize that if I wait a little bit of time or time goes on a little bit, things are going to change. And that's often our experience. We can move on with our life. And at the same time, it's important to keep the memory of someone or something that we've lost. And often, as you all will know, we experience loss with loved ones who suffer from this disease. In fact, as we move through life, these memories actually can and should become more and more integral to defining the people we are and continuing to love the people we are loving and caring for. Because though their faculties may not be where they are, they are not just a shell of themselves of their former selves, I should say. They are that person who simply has a disease that they cannot help. And when we realize that, one, our compassion, our empathy 
and love that we're able to express to them will allow us to decrease our stress levels so that our caregiving and our enjoyment for wherever we find them today, we can look and list the things that they are able to do, that spirit of gratitude of what we do have today and that tomorrow will worry about itself. And we just sometimes need to live with where things are today as we journey particularly through experiencing loss for what our loved ones have lost and what we have lost as a result of their disease process. Mm 